Joe Biden introduces Kamala Harris as his vice presidential pick, while the media run cover for her radicalism. President Trump looks for an angle of attack, and the media cannot handle good news on COVID. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Protect your online privacy today at expressvpn.com. Slash Ben. A lot of news to get to. We'll get to all of it in just one second. First, you may have noticed that there's a lot of uncertainty right now. Like, we've got a presidential election going on. COVID continues to dominate the news. The economy is really, really up and down. Like, we don't know where things are going next. Now might be a pretty good time to diversify at least a little bit into precious metals. In fact, I've been telling you that since 2016. And to invest in precious metals with Birch Gold. That was way back when gold was 1300 bucks an ounce. Right now, gold is at a new all-time high. Why? Well, gold and silver thrive on uncertainty, and I cannot imagine a more uncertain time than this one. I'll tell you again, if you haven't reached out to Birch Gold to diversify part of your IRA or 401k into a precious metals IRA or just purchase physical gold or silver from them, go ahead and do it today. Text Ben to 474747. Get a free information kit on protecting your savings with gold. Listen, I have a little bit of my money in precious metals. You should too. I trust the folks over at Birch Gold. They've got an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, countless five-star reviews. Talk to them. Ask all your questions, get all the information when you feel comfortable, then talk about investing a little bit of your money in precious metals. Text Ben to 474747. When you open an IRA in precious metals before August 30th, you'll be the first to get a signed copy of my new book, How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps for Free. Again, text Ben to 474747 right now. Text Ben to 474747. All righty. So yesterday was the big day. It was the day when Joe Biden would present Kamala Harris to the world. Now, we already knew Kamala Harris. We didn't like her much. But now was the moment when we were supposed to gaze upon her anew with new eyes. Now she was exciting. You remember that whole year or so when she was in the public eye and everybody thought she was terrible? And for like five seconds, everybody was like, wow, she's good at this because she was really mean to Joe Biden. And she said that he was a racist. And then she couldn't back that up because she was just saying things because that's what she does because she's terrible, opportunistic, authoritarian. And then she sort of disappeared. And everybody was kind of relieved, but the media was like, oh, man, isn't it sad that she's gone after she ran such a terrible campaign? And now she's back. And we're supposed to be soups excited that Kamala Harris is back because now she's great at this. I mean, a perfect indicator of this, by the way, is The New York Times. The New York Times took a picture of Kamala Harris on the day she dropped out and talked about her chaotic, terrible campaign. That was basically the headline. And then they used the exact same picture, just a little bit closer up. And then when she was selected as VP, it was historic moment. Kamala Harris selected as Joe Biden's VP. And same exact picture, two completely different headlines because the media can swivel on a dime. Whatever the Democrats need, the media will be there to provide it. So yesterday, Joe Biden presented Harris to the world. This was shortly after Joe Biden read a script to Kamala Harris offering her the job. It was very spontaneous. The whole, the whole situation was incredibly spontaneous. For some reason, Joe Biden was wearing a mask with nobody in sight. And also he was reading off a note card that reminded him who Kamala Harris was. Not really kidding. And also he was holding his cell phone upside down, but he then had a very spontaneous conversation. And it's this sort of spontaneity and joy we can look forward to for the next three months at a very minimum. Here was the original conversation, supposedly, between Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And you can listen to how surprised and overjoyed Kamala, almost as surprised as she was when she loved the bus. Remember that time when Kamala Harris loved the bus, right? Back during her campaign, they presented her with the repainted bus from the fugitive that she had used to bus truant children over to the juvenile detention facility. Remember that one? And Harris came out and she looked at the bus and she was like super duper happy. Do you have tape of that? Kamala Harris loving the bus. Look at my bus! Oh my God, I love it. Oh, wow. Look at the bus. And you remember, that was like take 37. That was the one where she looked super spontaneous, right? Well, now we get that same level of spontaneity and joy and happiness. I mean, she's just a joyful, spontaneous, happy person, Kamala Harris. When Joe Biden presents her with a VP pick, here that was yesterday. Hi, 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 hi. Sorry to keep you. No, that's all right. You ready to go to work? Oh, my God. I'm so ready to go to work. First of all, is the answer yes? The answer is absolutely <laughs> yes, Joe. And I am ready to work. I am ready to do this with you, for you. I, I just, I'm just deeply honored and I'm very excited. Okay, and then she proceeded, I kid you not, to go into a 45-second stump speech on criminal justice reform and all of her various policies. So it wasn't rehearsed in any way. You could tell because you have the guy in the background who's playing the music so that, with, the, with the little guitar, the meaningful guitar. So it was a joyous moment. It was a joyous moment when Harris was announced at an empty gym in Wilmington, Delaware, because Joe Biden, thanks to his, uh, his conditions being like very, very old and never wanting to go anywhere, 
he went like a mile down the road to a gym and a big crowd gathered outside. Crowds were good again, right? So you remember that time crowds were real bad and crowds were real bad because of COVID. And then crowds got good when it was for Black Lives Matter. Then crowds were really, really awesome. And in fact, they were fighting a health problem. Well, then they were bad again because the BLM protests sort of waned and you saw some people partying. And so those crowds were bad. Well, now the crowds are good again because they were gathered outside of the Joe Biden festivities. And by the way, that was like 100 people, which is levels of enthusiasm unmatched since the last Nickelback concert. Anyway, the, the crowd gathered outside. The whole thing was, was really run beautifully. CNN reported that the gym had no air conditioning and there was a power outage at the event site, which is apt to happen in Wilmington, Delaware, on the spur of the moment, because this thing is being run like a third grade secretary for student council campaign. Basically, never leave your homeroom, but campaign from your homeroom, Joe Biden. So here was CNN reporting that yesterday. We know they're delayed right now. It was supposed right. to start earlier. And I'm just hearing in my ear that there was a, a there's an issue with the power outage at the school. Is that what is behind the delay? It, it, it certainly could be one of the reasons behind the, the delay. But we also know that Biden campaign events often are late. We do expect this uh, momentarily. But again, not probably the best uh, rollout to look that they had planned. Uh, so Biden was about an hour late to this thing. The good news is that Joe Biden didn't notice that. He, he just called it early bird dinner. So then Joe Biden finally arrives to introduce Kamala Harris. And he makes it perfectly obvious, the appeal of Kamala Harris. Namely, she checks all the intersectional boxes, right? We, we can all be real about this. If Joe Biden had his druthers, he would have chosen somebody who was not Kamala Harris. He would have chosen perhaps Amy Klobuchar, with whom he is close, and whose endorsement at the, at the sort of tail end of the campaign actually meant an awful lot because it helped shift support behind Biden right before the South Carolina primaries. Yeah, he, he may have preferred Cory Booker. He may have preferred a man, but he boxed himself into a corner by saying, I need a black woman, basically. And that limited his choices to a bunch of people who are not senators and Kamala Harris. So then he's going to use that as a weapon. So his new weapon is, here is my VP pick, Kamala Harris, a black woman. And if you attack her in any way, it's because she is black and also a woman. That is the only reason that you would be upset with Kamala Harris is because she's black and also a woman. Not that she's a terrible candidate, not that she's a radical, not that she's an authoritarian with opportunistic tendencies. Nope. The reason you're attacking her is because she's black and a woman. So here's Joe Biden doing this routine yesterday. Donald Trump has already started his attacks, calling Kamala, quote, nasty, whining about how she is, quote, mean to his appointees. <laughs> it's no surprise because whining is what Donald Trump does best, better than any president in American history. Is anyone surprised Donald Trump has a problem with a strong woman or strong women across the board? Okay, and this is going to be the line. Yeah, get ready for the media to cover this line. Whatever the Democrat line is, the, the beautiful thing about the media is they really are a fantastic communications organ for the Democratic Party. It's truly incredible. This was the line, as we'll see. Like all of yesterday, it will be for all of today, it will be for the next several weeks, is that any attack on Kamala Harris betrays your sexism and your... Racism. Right, wait for it. Sexism and racism. Okay, there's going to be a lot of that. Okay, so then Biden said, let me introduce you to your next vice president, Kamala Harris, in an empty gym. And she's looking at him with the, uh, with the Cheshire cat smile. Joe, get a food taster. Here was Joe Biden, <laughs> was Joe Biden yesterday. We need to get to work. Pulling this nation out of these crises we find ourselves in. Getting our economy back on track, uniting this nation, and yes, winning the battle for the soul of America. My fellow Americans, now let me introduce to you, for the first time, your next Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Okay, Kamala Harris. Okay, and also he uh, mispronounced her name at some point in his speech. So we should point that out because Tucker Carlson mispronounced her name, and that meant that Tucker Carlson was a racist. So I will admit that because I'm familiar with Kamala Harris, she's been the senator from my garbage state for several years here and was AG before that. I used to pronounce it the way that it kind of looks on paper, which is Kamala. Right? It looks like the emphasis should be on the second syllable. But in fact, the emphasis is on the first syllable. It is pronounced Kamala. Right? I only know that again because I'm from California, but you could be forgiven for mispronouncing the name. It's not exactly a common name. And in, in, in if you've if you got to take the list of the most common names in America, Kamala is probably not near the top of the list. Joe Biden screwed it up yesterday. It's obviously because he's a racist and also a sexist. Here was Joe Biden yesterday. When I agreed to serve as President Obama's running mate, he asked me a number of questions as I've asked Kamala. But the most important was, he said to me, 
what he asked me what I wanted, most importantly. I told him I wanted to be the last person in the room before he made important decisions. That's what I asked Kamala. Kamala. Ah, there she is. Kamala. Like through an eye of a needle, Kamala. So th- he's a racist. And, 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 th- and she'll go back to doing that, by the way. If ever it should be con- become convenient, Joe Biden should watch for the knife between the shoulder blades where she goes right back to suggesting that he is credibly accused of sexual assault and also is a, is a racist. At some point, somebody in the media probably should do a little bit of journalism and ask her, you know, what changed in your opinion about Joe Biden? What convinced you that he was no longer a sexual harasser? Did new evidence emerge or are you just opportunistic and terrible? Nobody will ever ask her that question, of course, because they are busy massaging her buttocks. This is what the media do on a regular basis. And it's not just her, obviously, any Democrat. I mean, Barack Obama, the, the, the number of massage oils available to the press in the White House press room for Barack Obama is pretty astonishing. I mean, they had like, the, they had all of the, the sort of chamomile smells. They would actually dim the lights during the press conferences with Barack Obama in preparation for the massage to follow. And then Harris got up. And, uh, and she just lied about things because that's what Kamala Harris does because she's actually a terrible, terrible person and a bad politician. So yesterday she, she gets up and she says, you know, the Trump administration really screwed up the response to COVID. Now, there are things you can say here that would make some sense, right? They should have accelerated the testing. How is it that we're several months in here and the testing delays are still so great that if you're in New Jersey and you get a test, it could still take you seven to 14 days to get a result, which is essentially useless. Why is it that the Trump administration didn't take this thing more seriously at the very beginning, and the president didn't take masking more seriously at the very beginning. Why was the president in conflict with his expert? Right? Like, there, there are things you can say, and they're a little bit more shaded, and there's probably some truth to them. And then the response would be pretty obvious, which is that Democrats also didn't take this thing super seriously at the beginning. And, and you can have that conversation, right? That conversation is a haveable conversation. Or you could leverage the stupidest possible attack imaginable about COVID. So because Kamala Harris is a rote, manipulative, lying and awful politician. She did precisely the latter. This is maybe the stupidest point about COVID anyone has yet made. But don't worry, guys. She is just a godsend. She is the new politics. She's the new face of American Democratic Party politics. Wow, what a wonder Kamala Harris is. Here she was yesterday saying something unbelievably stupid. It didn't have to be this way. Six years ago, in fact, we had a different health crisis. It was called Ebola. And we all remember that pandemic. But you know what happened then? Barack Obama and Joe Biden did their job. Only two people in the United States died. Two. That is what's called leadership. Wow. So she just compared COVID, a highly transmissible disease that, in fact, good evidence shows now is airborne, with Ebola, which is transmitted through bodily fluids, and not nearly as transmissible, and far more deadly, but also not nearly as transmissible. She may as well have gotten up there and said, you know, during the during the Obama administration, only two Americans died of wild rhinoceros attacks because Barack Obama knew how to stop wild rhinoceri. That is, that is Barack Obama was an expert at stopping death. But COVID, I mean, let's face it, Trump... Lo- Ebola is not any anything like, like remotely like this. And the reason that she didn't go to bird flu, the reason she didn't go to H1N1 is because the Obama administration blew it and just got lucky. The thing wasn't nearly as transmissible or, or as deadly overall as COVID has been. H1N1 is pretty well blown by the, by the Obama administration. It turns out that global unprecedented pandemics are not well handled across the world. Across the world right now, as we're going to get to a little bit later on in the show, we're seeing spikes in a lot of places. People thought they were already done. Spain, France, Germany. Obviously, Ron DeSantis' fault and Trump's fault. But the the sheer dishonesty, and there's not a single fact check of this today. There's not a single fact check. No one in the media is like, hey, wait, isn't that weird that you just compared Ebola to COVID when they are completely dissimilar diseases? Like, absolutely 100% dissimilar. One is only transmitted, again, through bodily fluids. Like, you get vomited on directly in the face, or there's diarrhea or something. That's how Ebola gets transmitted. Versus COVID, where you're in the same room with a human for 10 minutes, and you probably get COVID if the person has COVID. That seems a little different, but that wasn't Kamala Harris's only lie of her acceptance of the VP speech here. She also suggested that Donald Trump had mysteriously tanked the American economy. So here's another lie. Will she be fact-checked on this? Of course not. The media are too busy laying out rose petals on the path from the podium 
to the to the White House vice presidential office. They've got those rose petals. They've got the little glasses of champagne, you know, but not not the expensive ones, like the, the cheap ones, like the brute champagne with like the with the, the cheap plastic glasses. They can't afford anything better. But, you know, they're doing their best. Here was it's OK. They, they also got her some jewelry. They, they went to they went to case. In any case, here was Kamala Harris lying about the economy as well. No fact checks on this one either. Trump is also the reason millions of Americans are now unemployed. He inherited the longest economic expansion in history from Barack Obama and Joe Biden. And then, like everything else he inherited, he ran it straight into the ground. Ah, because he inherited wealth and then he ran it. Okay, so I, I have a question. Are you old enough to remember back to March, like the beginning of March? Are you old enough to remember that when we had like a 4% unemployment rate in the United States? Do you remember that? Because you're older than six months old, you're older than my baby daughter. So you're old enough to remember that. Has something happened, like an intervening event perhaps, that may have changed the nature of the American economy? Also, in response, is it not the case that the federal government between the Federal Reserve blowing out the spending and Congress blowing out the spending has spent somewhere on the order of seven to eight trillion dollars in the past six months? Something like that, which seems like a pretty robust response from the federal government. Because um, according to Kamala Harris, basically everything was going swimmingly. And then the economy tanked in 2017. Okay, so are there any fact checks of this today? Of course, there are no fact checks of this today. Of course, there are no fact checks of this today because Kamala Harris is a truth teller and the Democrats are truth tellers. COVID is just like Ebola and the economy was, was getting killed by Trump before COVID. She, what, what, a stellar, what a stellar human being Kamala Harris is and what stellar people we have in our media as well. We'll get to the media coverage in just one second. Journalisming up the wazoo. I mean, they're just getting the journalism everywhere. It's crazy. They just sit there and they pant in the journalism everywhere. It's insane. We'll get to that in just one second. First, especially with the economy in pretty uncertain territory, businesses, you need to be smart with your expenses. I mean, right now, can you really afford to be spending too much on things like postage? Of course you cannot. You need to be cutting costs wherever you can. Plus, you need to save time because time is, in fact, money. This is why Stamps.com exists. Thousands of small business owners have discovered the benefits of Stamps.com in recent months. They've been able to keep their businesses running and avoid the crowds at the post office all from their own computers. With Stamps.com, you can print on-demand postage, avoid going to the post office. Stamps.com also offers UPS services now with discounts up to 62%, no residential surcharges. Here at Daily Wire, we've been using Stamps.com since 2017, one of the reasons we're a thriving, magnificent business. We don't waste our time sending people to wait in line at the post office, and we're not spending extra money on postage. We don't need to. Right now, you can use your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7, any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send it. Once your mail is ready, just leave it for your mail carrier, schedule a pickup, drop it in a mailbox. It is indeed that simple. As I say, with stamps.com, you get those great discounts, five cents off every stamp, 62% off USPS and UPS shipping rates. Go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, type in Shapiro, get a special deal. That includes a four-week trial, plus free postage, and a digital scale, no long-term commitments. Again, just go to stamps.com, click on that microphone at the top of the homepage, type in Shapiro. That is stamps.com, enter code Shapiro. Okay, so the media come out four square for Kamala Harris, and they are defending all of the all of the lines of attack. So there are several lines of attack on Kamala Harris. One, she's deeply inauthentic and terrible. Two, she happens to be extraordinarily radical on politics. Okay, it, it is a basic truth that Kamala Harris is a radical. I played you 1,000 clips of her yesterday being extraordinarily radical. Everything from Medicare for all, and we're going to kill your private health insurance, to illegal immigrants should get Medicare, to the ICE is like the KKK, to Justice Brett Kavanaugh is probably a rapist, to I'm going to use executive orders to get rid of all guns, right? I mean, all assault weapons, by which she means basically semi-automatic guns of any sort. And Kamala Harris is an authoritarian leftist. She is rated by virtually every objective political analysis as the most leftist senator, senator in the United States Senate, like to the left of Bernie Sanders, according to many of these analyses. The media, however, have decided that they're going to defend against this by simply declaring her a moderate. I mean, magically, she's just a moderate now. It was amazing how that happened. Five seconds ago, she was a, a radical leftist and everybody knew it, but now she needs to be a moderate. And so thus, poof, she's a moderate. George Stephanopoulos, again, objective journalist, George Stephanopoulos, who wrote in his memoir, about looking at Hillary Clinton and crying together upon Bill Clinton's victory in 1992, George Stephanopoulos. And um, I mean, it's just, it's insane to me still. It will never stop being insane to me that the Keebler elf, George Stephanopoulos, who worked for the Clinton administration as like their head of comms, that that guy ended up as the chief news anchor at ABC News. It's like Carl Rove ending up as chief news anchor for NBC. 
That, that's really what it was. I mean, this is crazy. But George Stephanopoulos, not a Democratic Party hack, mind you. Not a Democratic Party hack. A master of journalism. George Stephanopoulos, the pre-Jim Acosta, Jim Acosta. The granddaddy of Acostaism. George Stephanopoulos, yesterday, he declared that Kamala Harris comes from the middle of the Democratic Party. Oh, does she? Does she now? Here he was yesterday. Kamala Harris comes from the middle of the road, moderate wing of the Democratic uh, Party, not the first choice of progressives, but Joe Biden banking that this historic move as the first woman of color on a national ticket will overcome that. Ah, that, that's what it is. She's, she's, she's from the middle of the Democratic Party. That's, she's moderate now, guys. Forget all the stuff we said about her being a radical. She's moderate. Chris Wallace did this routine yesterday, and this I'm surprised by because Wallace is a better journalist than this. I mean, seriously, this is just bad journalism. He says, you know, Republicans are going to attack her as a wild leftist, but she isn't far left. Um, Yes, she is. Yes, she is. By any objective metric, she is one of the, if she's not the most liberal senator in the United States Senate, she's one of the top four. Okay, here is, here is Chris Wallace yesterday just getting this completely wrong. She did not do very well in the Democratic primaries, but that's for a variety of reasons. She didn't run a great campaign. But, you know, she is not far to the left, despite what uh, Republicans are going to try to say. She, there is a, a certain uh, circuitous route to her position on issues. Uh, she was for Medicare for all before she was against it. But, uh, you know, I think, I think she's a reasonably safe choice. Circuitous? No. No. She's manipulative. She stakes out a very leftist position, and then she moved away from that leftist position a little bit when it became clear that she was struggling in the primaries. But she is of the hard left by her voting record. You know who's open about this? James Clyburn. So James Clyburn, who was one of the early endorsers of Joe Biden, his endorsement of Joe Biden in South Carolina really gave Biden a boost right before those primaries. He said yesterday, we're moving back to the left. So who do you believe? James Clyburn, who's actually in Congress with Kamala Harris, or all the journalists who are busy covering for Kamala Harris? This country goes like a pendulum on the clock. This country doesn't move in a linear plane. It goes left for a while. It goes back right for a while. You saw this country go left and elect Barack Obama. It went back right and elected uh, Donald Trump. This country is going back to the left. I mean, how high are the hopes for Kamala Harris on the hard left? High, because they understand that she's an authoritarian leftist. MSNBC contributor Jason Johnson from formerly of The Root, he announced yesterday that Kamala Harris will impeach Trump judges if she becomes president. That Kamala Harris will essentially treat the GOP like the GOP treated the debathification of Saddam Hussein's party. He actually made that comparison on MSNBC yesterday. Here was, here was Jason Johnson on MSNBC. Somebody's got to go through and find all of these incompetent, unqualified, corrupt, white nationalist supporting people that Trump has burrowed into our State Department, burrowed into our Justice Department. And I think Senator Harris would be fantastic at finding those people and removing them because she'll have the skill set to not only get rid of the officials and the bureaucrats, she can help us impeach some of these judges, these underqualified judges that Donald Trump has managed to push in. Don't worry. She's going to be a perfect moderate. She is a moderate. She's a moderate's moderate, guys. Just like Barack Obama was touted as moderate in 2008 before he started pushing extraordinarily radical plans on health care and spending and restructuring of the American governmental system. Just a moderate, just a moderate. And the, and the other defense is obvious, right? The other defense of Kamala Harris, besides that she is a moderate, which she obviously is not, is that any line of attack on Kamala Harris is once again a reflection of your racism and also your sexism. We'll get to that in just one second. First, let us talk about censorship on social media sites, what you can do about it. The left would like to silence and remove any voices they don't agree with. Twitter, for example, was supposed to be an open platform. I don't really need their content moderators preventing me from seeing things I would like to see. So instead of letting social media sites revoke your right to free speech, how about revoking their right to your data? The way they make money is by taking your data and then monetizing it. If you've ever wondered how free to access social media sites make all their cash, they track your searches, your video history, everything you click on, and then they sell your valuable data. You don't have to let them do that. Instead, use ExpressVPN the way that I do. When you use ExpressVPN, you anonymize much of your online presence by hiding your IP address, which makes your activity more difficult to trace and sell. And ExpressVPN couldn't be easier to set up. You just tap one button on your phone or computer. You are now protected. It also protects you from hackers who are looking for your credit card number, by the way. ExpressVPN encrypts 100% of your data to protect you from hackers and internet bad guys. It's finally time to say no to censorship and take back your online privacy at expressvpn.com. By visiting my special link, you get an extra three months of ExpressVPN service for free. Again, that's expressvpn.com. Expressvpn.com. To protect your data today, expressvpn.com. 
dot com slash Ben. You get an extra three months of Express VPN service for free. Okay, so the other the other defense of Kamala Harris is is of course that if you attack her in any way, it's because of racism and sexism. First, I just want to mention how excited the members of the media are. And if you don't believe me, how excited they are, they'll just tell you. Mika Brzezinski on MSNBC, she was like, I am so excited. I am so excited. She was so excited. Here she was being excited, telling you how excited she was about being excited. She really connected with the women in the audience, extremely not just likable, as they talk about, as they, you know, people cover mm-hmm. campaigns and talk about temperament, but she cares about women's issues. She she cares about equality deep within her soul from her yeah. own experience. Um, we've had a great time knowing her so far, and it's kind of exciting. This pick- Is it? Is it now? I mean, eh. Ugh, this is so tiresome. By the way, the journalism over at the New York Times, incredible levels. Nick, Nick Confessori is, I kid you not, a reporter for the New York Times. He's also a staff writer at New York Times Magazine and an MSNBC political analyst. Here's what he tweeted yesterday. Don't think I've seen a candidate in a while who seemed as purely happy and joyful as Harris during that speech. And why wouldn't she be? So much joy, so much authenticity. Why shouldn't you? I mean, first of all, she should be happy. She was just plucked from complete failure and obscurity to be made the vice president of the United States, possibly. So that, that seems like she should be happy. But th- that sort of reporting, that's Pulitzer Prize level stuff. I mean, just well done, everybody. Well done, everybody. But of course, the real line of attack for the Democrats is going to be that any attack on Kamala Harris, any, will be racist and sexist. Susan Rice trotted this one out. Susan Rice, who is likely to be a secretary of state in a Joe Biden administration, God help us all. She said, and the only the only way you could attack a wonderful person like Kamala Harris is if you are a here she was yesterday. There will be those that employ racism and sexism. Look at Donald Trump yesterday, you know, calling her nasty. He would have done that to any person that Joe Biden selected uh, on the ticket. And and that's the undertone. There are those who will not retreat from that kind of divisiveness and hatred. And Donald Trump exemplifies it. Um, she literally just said he would have called anybody she, that, that Biden picked nasty. And then she was like, it's racist and sexist to call her nasty. These two things do not go together. By the way, Donald Trump will call anybody nasty. He uses that adjective all the time. Have you noticed that Donald Trump, well, he may have the best words. There are only about eight of them. And nasty is in that lexicon. He reuses a lot of these terms. But every term that Donald Trump uses is now going to be, be recast as he's a racist and a sexist. And we've been seeing this for years, right? Anytime he says something bad about a woman of color, for example, it turns into the only reason he's attacking me is because I'm a woman of color. It's not because I'm bad at my job or because he attacks everybody. It's because he hates black women. And we saw this with Mayor Lori Lightfoot in Chicago. She's like, look at the people he's attacking. He's attacking me. He's attacking Keisha Lance Bottoms. And it's like, no, he's also attacking Ted Wheeler, who happens to be a super white dude. He's attacking that, that mayor of Minneapolis, who is also a super white dude. But no, it's all about the racism. It's all about the sexism. This is such a tired playbook. It is so tired. It is so old. It is so boring. But this is the line. Jennifer Palmieri, the former communications director for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign, told Lawrence O'Donnell yesterday that the Biden campaign and Senator Kamala Harris are prepared to fight back sexist attacks from Donald Trump. Super duper sexist attacks against against Kamala Harris. And And that's all the attacks are. They are all indubitably and unstoppably sexist. This is every article in the New York Times today. All of them. All of them. The entire New York Times front to back, including the non-existent sports section. The classifieds. Every classified is Donald Trump launches sexist attack against Kamala Harris. Here's one of those articles from the New York Times today. Kamala Harris crystallizes Trump's view of women. They're nasty or housewives. Wow, that, this is some solid analysis by, by Katie Rogers. As Ms. Harris joined the Democratic ticket, the president wasted no time calling her nasty and praising the suburban housewife he says will vote for him. His views are out of step with reality. In the hours since Senator Kamala Harris joined the Democratic presidential ticket, says the New York Times, President Trump has responded by sorting women into two categories. The good suburban housewife he believes will vote for him and nasty women who have not shown him or his political allies a sufficient amount of respect. Okay, so let us be frank. President Trump is not wildly articulate. It is also not true that he has sorted American women into two categories, suburban housewives and nasty women. This is a complete conjecture on the part of the New York Times. In fact, he thinks many things about women, some of them very inappropriate. But the idea that basically the only reason he's attacking Kamala Harris is nasty is because she is a woman is absolutely and patently silly. 
After Joe Biden, according to the New York Times, the presumptive Democratic nominee, announced Tuesday Harris would be his running mate, Trump wasted no time sorting her into the nasty camp, a category occupied by the last woman to run against him on a Democratic ticket. She was extraordinarily nasty to Brett Kavanaugh. Judge Kavanaugh then, or Justice Kavanaugh, said Trump. Um, that's true, though. She was unbelievably nasty to Brett Kavanaugh. I mean, that is a factually true statement. It, what, what she did to him was nasty and cruel and vicious. So how about we just leave nasty by the side? Can we say cruel and vicious? Because she was. She was cruel and vicious. She implied that a, by all accounts, good man was a rapist. That's what she did. And she also suggested, by way of going after him, that he was involved in some sort of unspecified corrupt scheme to skew the Mueller investigation or something. She's, she's a cruel human being, Kamala Harris. I mean, she's... There are many women who are not cruel. Kamala Harris is not one of them. And it was nasty what she did to Brett Kavanaugh. Nasty has a specific meaning. It is not sexist. Okay, the, but every word that is going to be used about Kamala Harris is now going to be perceived as sexist. That's the way this works. It's unbelievably high levels of gaslighting. Any word you use about Kamala Harris will now be turned automatically into a racist, sexist word. So, for example, there is a, a piece in Politico today essentially suggesting that if you say that Kamala Harris is phony, phony is now a sexist term. If you say phony, then that is, that is sexist as well. Nasty is, is a particular favorite, though, of the, of the various media outlets. According to the Washington Post, also that word nasty is bad. Ashley Parker writing for the Washington Post. Again, incredible levels of journalism. President Trump has called magazines, pharmaceutical advertisements, and questions nasty. He's called rumors numbers, and one unnamed TV columnist who gave The Apprentice a bad review, nasty. He has called men nasty, and he has called women nasty. Okay, well, isn't that a pretty good indicator? It ain't a sexist term. He calls everything nasty. He'll be like, that's a nasty poll. Like, that's a nasty dog, like a dog. Right? Everything's nasty. But if he says it about a woman, uniquely, psh, like a like a focusing of a laser beam, it's sexism. And so just hours after former VP Joe Biden announced Kamala Harris as his running mate, Trump reached for one of his favorite adjectives and dismissed the first woman of color on a major party ticket as nasty. Speaking to reporters Tuesday, he described her activity during the questioning of Brett Kavanaugh as nasty to a level that was just a horrible thing. True. He said she was the meanest and most horrible in pressing Kavanaugh. True. He said her debate stage attacks against Biden were very, very nasty. True. The insult is one Trump has levied roughly equally against men and women alike since becoming president, according to Factbase, a data analytics company that tracks all of Trump's public utterances. He did use it far more frequently during the 2016 campaign against women than men, but that's because he was running against Hillary Clinton. But here, okay, this is unbelievable. Uh, man, reportorial courage right here. The resonance of the adjective, the way the attack lands, the nuances in connotation is often different when the recipient is a woman and different still when that woman is a person of color. Calling a woman nasty, say many experts in women in politics, is another way to deliberately dismiss and demean female politicians. Holy effing S. Like, re wow, wow. So you spend the first several paragraphs acknowledging Freely, that Donald Trump uses the word nasty to describe everything from foot odor to toothpaste. And then you're like, but if he uses that exact same turn for this lady, suddenly, poof, it's transformed. Voila, abracadabra. It is now transformed into racism and also sexism. Stephanie Shriok, president of Emily's List. Yeah, she's a, she's a linguistic expert. Well, let's go to the abortion lady. Abortion lady, what say you about President Trump? I think he's a racist and a sexist. Thank you, abortion lady. Your opinion is valued here. I love this. Linguistics professor and fan of abortion, Stephanie Shriok, says it has really become coded language for a woman. It tries to put her in a place that is unacceptable to society. Our society allows for poor behavior by men, but has little acceptance for anything but perfection by women. Yes, I am sure this is the case. You are absolutely correct, Stephanie Shriok. Our society allows for poor behavior by men, but has little acceptance for anything but perfection by women. Really, I seem to remember, because I'm, again, older than a week old, I'm old enough to remember when I did a 10-minute segment mocking a song in which two women gallivanted around singing about their wet-ass P-words. For those in Media Matters, I say P-words because this also appears on radio, you stupid ass. <laughs> so we'll bleep that out. But <laughs> let me just point out to you that I made fun of a song and the entire world went insane because I simply said that perhaps it is not the most ennobling 
aspect of femininity to spend three minutes talking about the moisture state of your genitals. And this was considered bad taste. This was considered as though it was an attack on women. No, perfection is expected from women. It's absolutely expected from women. According to Emily Shriok, if you say nasty about a woman, then it's really different than saying nasty about a man because perfection is expected for women. Like, for example, you could be a former prostitute who drugged and stole money from men, and then you could rap about your vagina for three minutes straight. And this is an excellent, excellent indicator that you are a hero of the American Republic. Not only that, there were article, there was an article in Vulture yesterday, I noticed, in which the columnist compared, I kid you not, that particular song, which is too vulgar for radio, they compared that particular song to Shakespeare by way of pornography. Okay, that would be true if Shakespeare hit his head on a brick repeatedly and then fell headlong into a toilet and died and went to hell and ended up listening to a Cardi B song. That's the only way you can connect Shakespeare to that. But don't worry, guys. Perfection is expected of women. Who knew? Who knew? Well done, everybody. New Washington Post report. Uh, wow. Solid reporting. Trump, said Shriak, knows exactly what he's doing. Aparna Thomas, a professor of politics and gender, sexuality and women's studies. Oh, well, she's going to be an expert, too. I mean, she is a professor of politics and gender and sexuality and women's studies. So she's a professional useless person who makes money telling people stupid crap about gender that is not scientifically accurate. Said the descriptor is dismissive and signifies that women are not to be taken seriously. She said it was significant that nasty was the inaugural attack Trump hurled at Harris. This is a... This, this is in the Washington Post, guys. That's the first thing that comes to the president's mind is that she's to dis be dismissed and that she's a nasty woman. We're now back to 2016 where we have a vice presidential candidate who is female and is still being judged by a different set of standards set by men. You're damned right she's being judged by a different set of standards than men, than men, not set by men. She's judged by a different set of standards than men because you know what we would call a presidential candidate who failed so radically that he dropped out before the primaries even began. We would call them not VP. We would call them not VP. Cory Booker sitting over here crying to himself because he's a man. Cory Booker is better qualified by leagues than Kamala Harris. The man at least ran a city. Okay, like, it's just, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. But, so, so he uses the same word, nasty, for men and women. But if he uses it against a woman, then it's a sexist term. Magically. Magically. It's just, it, it, unbelievable. Okay, so. This is solid stuff, really solid stuff. Valerie Jarrett was quoted here too because Valerie Jarrett, another unbiased source on linguistics. The words nasty and mean are much more pejorative when directed at a woman, said Valerie Jarrett, senior advisor to former President Obama and a board member of Time's Up, a legal defense fund for women who are victimized in the workplace except for Tara Reid when she accuses Joe Biden of sticking his hand up her. There's this whole sense that women need to be likable. And when you say they're nasty or mean, that is intended to cut them deeply. Whereas men are not subjected to the same likability test. Are they not now? Really? Men don't have to be likable? Interesting. Because um, I've been following politics for a, a quite a long time. So good journalism there from the Washington Post. We'll get to more of the journalism. Magnificent, magnificent journalism about Kamala Harris in a second. Plus, we'll get to President Trump and his lines of attack and the media's obvious misrepresentation of some comments that President Trump made yesterday. Again, just to be fair, when the president says stuff that's dumb, it may be dumb, but it's not quite how the media portray it. We'll get to that in one second. First, let us talk about the quality of your mattress. Helix Sleep has a quiz. It takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Whether you're a side sleeper or a hot sleeper, whether you like a plush or from bed, with Helix, there's no more confusion and no more compromising. Helix Sleep is rated the number one mattress by GQ and Wired Magazine. CNN called it the most comfortable mattress they've ever slept on. Just go to helixsleep.com slash Ben, take their two-minute sleep quiz. They will match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They have a 10-year warranty. You get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you indeed will. Helix is offering up to 200 bucks off all mattress orders for our listeners. Get up to 200 bucks off at helixsleep.com slash Ben. That is helixsleep.com slash Ben. You know, I don't get tons of sleep at night because I've got a little baby girl and she is just the best, but she is not the best in the middle of the night. She likes to wake us up. That means that I really value the times of the evening when I'm on that Helix Sleep mattress, asleep in a way, you can too. Helix is offering up to 200 bucks off all mattress orders for our listeners. Get up to 200 bucks off at helixsleep.com slash Ben. Again, that is helixsleep.com slash Ben for the special order up to $200 off all mattress orders for our listeners. All righty, we're going to get to more amazing media coverage in just one second. First, I want to tell you about our most exclusive membership tier over at Daily Wire. It is the all access tier where you can hear me curse unmitigated. All Access members get to join the All Access Live. That's our exclusive live stream Q&As hosted every night by each of the hosts, including me. 
this Thursday, August 13th, for example, I will be hosting an all access live. That is today, guys, today. We'll be discussing my new book, How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps, which has been at the top of the charts since it was released in July. Got a lot of amazing feedback questions from you, the readers. So this Thursday night, I'll be taking questions, discussing some of the themes, ideas, et cetera, in the book with all of you, all access members. All access members, you also get exclusive access to live online discussions with our other hosts, writers, special guests. You get not one, but two, count them, two leftist tears tumblers with your membership, as well as early and sometimes exclusive access to new Daily Wire products. You saw that last week. We had a limited account collector's edition baseball bat available only to all access members. We sold out in less than 48 hours. So head on over to dailywire.com slash Shapiro right now to get 20% off all access with coupon code access. You can also get my book, How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps at Amazon or Barnes & Noble if you want to join the discussion. Remember, dailywire.com slash Shapiro with coupon code access to get 20% off your membership. You're listening to the largest, fastest growing podcast and radio show in America. <laughs> All righty, so when the media are not just glowing over Kamala Harris and, signif- and, and suggesting that everybody who opposes Kamala Harris for any reason is, in ra- is a radical sexist, they're also printing people's personal experiences with Kamala Harris. And I, I will say the reactions to the Harris pick are insane on one. Like Anna Navarro tweeted out a picture of herself cuddling her little doggy and her, and her caption was, now that I know that Uncle Joe and Auntie, and Auntie Kamala are here to protect me, I feel so happy. And com- First of all, anytime you describe a politician as your relative, you're an idiot. If the politician is not your relative unless they're your creepy uncle who's staring at you in the shower. Politicians are terrible. They're awful, awful, awful. Okay, so if you treat members of the political class as members of your family, it's because you're incredibly dumb or incredibly hopeless in your life. But beyond that, we also have Katie Holmes tweeted out a weird sexualized picture of herself. Like even the Huffington Post was like, that's weirdly sexual, Katie Holmes, of herself in the mirror over Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Alyssa Milano tweeted out a gif of Biden walking next to Harris with just the caption, hope. Guys, go to church once in a while. Like, you know, find, fill that hole in your life with something other than this nonsense. And then you get headlines like this one from Donna Edwards, contributing columnist at the Washington Post. I thought it didn't matter whether Joe Biden picked a black woman and then it happened. Well, now, I mean, you have feelings. So because you have feelings, incredible. Uh, congratulations on your feelings. Very, very important stuff that people have feelings. And meanwhile, President Trump being subjected to the media's tender mercies. So President Trump is is struggling a little bit for his narrative on Kamala Harris because the narrative is pretty obvious and I've suggested it before. Joe Biden is not alive, right? Just ignore Joe Biden. Pretend like he doesn't exist because he basically doesn't at this point. By the way, even Democrats assume he doesn't exist. Yesterday, the California Attorney General, a man named Xavier Becerra, suggested that Harris was the top of the ticket. Freudian slip to the extreme here from Xavier Becerra. I didn't realize it, but this is the first time a California Democrat has been on the top of the ticket. And uh, it's about time. And wow, what a selection. Uh, You're talking about a guy, Joe Biden, who had the confidence to to pick one of his strongest rivals during this campaign. Very top of the ticket. Clearly. Okay, fine. So Joe, so everybody's assuming quietly or not quietly that Joe Biden is not going to finish out his first term. Everybody assumes this. 60 percent of the American public agree. So Trump should just ignore Biden. And what he should say is nothing Biden says about how he is going to be normal and he's going to protect you from the radical left. None of that is true. He just selected a radical leftist as his VP and he should go direct at Harris. Instead, yesterday, he argued that both Biden and Harris are socialists. That pitch doesn't have a lot of resonance because Biden has successfully categorized himself as not a socialist. Here is here is Trump kind of mixing up the two. You said socialism will never be in America. America will never be a socialist country. What are you doing to ensure that doesn't happen? I have to win the election because Kamala is a socialist. Biden's been brought. Look, Biden, you know, Biden, he's he's shut. He's been brought over. I guess he's a socialist. He doesn't. I don't If you asked him what a socialism mean, he, he wouldn't give you an answer. He has no clue. OK, so that line of attack isn't likely to be particularly successful because Biden is difficult to attack. Again, you can't beat a dead horse. But Kamala Harris is, in fact, a live socialist and so you can go after her. Along those lines, I mean, she's a Medicare for all redistributionist. There's a lot to attack with Kamala Harris. Okay, but yesterday, most of the focus was not really on even Trump and Kamala Harris. The media tried to misdirect to an answer that Trump gave about suburbia. So there is this housing and urban development policy that was pushed by the Obama administration. We've talked about a little bit before. I believe it's called the AFFH. It was under the HUD department. And that policy essentially forced states and localities, particularly localities, it forced them in order to receive federal dollars to allow the federal government to basically restructure all of their zoning laws such that you're putting low-income housing in suburban areas, 
which defeats the purpose of moving out to a suburb. If you move out to a suburb, the goal is that you want to live in an area that doesn't have a lot of low-income housing because low-income housing typically comes along with other factors, right? Because low-income typically comes along with other factors, including, for example, crime. That's not a racially-based case in any way, right? That, that is a class-based case, right? The, the People move from low-income areas to suburbs. This is what people have done historically in the United States. They've been doing it for literally a, a century or more. And it's been happening for a very long time in the United States. This goes all the way back to Jews in Brooklyn. Like they would be in Brooklyn, be very crowded. And eventually they would make a little more money. They'd move out to the suburbs of New Jersey, right? This, is, this has been going on for a long time. It is not necessarily a racial thing. It can be, but it is not necessarily a racial thing. So President Trump yesterday was saying the federal government basically restructuring neighborhoods along lines that people do not want is not correct. And what he is trying to say here, and it's pretty obvious, what he's trying to say here is that's true for minority people who live in suburbs too. They move out of areas. They move to suburbs because they want to be in areas that have better public schools, for example. They, they want to be in areas that have lower levels of crime. Okay, the way he says it is awkward. And so the media suggests that what he's really trying to do is resegregate suburbs. It is completely not what he's saying here. Again, the president's command of the English language is not, ex is not, I will say, exact and meticulous, but it is pretty obvious that he's not being a racist here. It didn't stop the media from pushing that anyway. What I mean is people are going to become... Uh, they're going to be opening up areas of your neighborhood, which they're doing, and now they're going to do, they wanted to expand it, and they will expand it. If for any reason, they're going to, in my opinion, destroy suburbia. And just so you understand, 30% plus of the people living in suburbia are minorities. African-American, Asian-American, Hispanic-American, they're minorities, 30%. The number's even higher. It's, they say 35, but I like to cut it a little bit lower. You know why? That way I can never get myself in too much trouble with the fake news. But 30% plus are minorities living in suburbia. And when they go in and they want to change zoning so that you have lots of problems, where they want to build low-income housing, uh, you want something where people can aspire to be there, not something where it gets hurt badly. And that's what happens. So with suburban women, suburban men, I think they feel very strongly about what I'm doing. It's a very, I mean, it's a very fair question. It's a very important question. But they fought all their lives to be there. And then all of a sudden, they have something happen that changes their life and changes what they fought for for so many years. Okay, it is perfectly obvious that he is not being racist there, right? He is saying that many people who live in the suburbs and have been inspiring to live in the suburbs are minorities and that it hurts people who live in the suburbs when you when you artificially place low-income housing in the suburbs. That's exactly what he is saying. Okay, the media played this. I'm gonna read you some of the headlines. The media played this as though he was being a racist. This was the big thing on Twitter yesterday. Business insider, Trump leans into race baiting in remarks about American suburbs. The Hill, Trump pitches fair housing repeal to suburban housewife with racist tropes. NewJersey.com, Booker tells Trump, your racism is showing after president hits him on low-income housing in suburbs. USA Today, critics slam Trump's suburban housewife treat as racist, sexist dog scream play for white voters. So get ready for it, guys. They tried this playbook with Hillary Clinton. Now they're going to try it with Kamala Harris. Anything Trump does from here for the rest of the campaign is going to be racist and sexist. And any criticism of Kamala Harris is going to be racist and sexist. Your media will make sure that this is considered the truth. By the way, how much should you trust your media? I have maybe the single best case of media malpractice I've ever seen on a fact check. Okay, so this one comes courtesy of the New York Times, and we shall conclude with this. Okay, so listen to this. This is pretty incredible. You remember a few, a few days ago, there was this story that emerged from Portland, Oregon, where Black Lives Matter protesters burned some Bibles on top of American flags. Do you remember this? They burned Bibles on top of American flags. There was tape of it. There was, there was, we, we, we played it on the show. Here is the New York Times fact check of this. This is why nobody trusts the media, nor should they. Here's the New York Times fact check. Quote, a Bible burning, a Russian news agency, and a story too good to check out. From Matthew Rosenberg and Julian E. Barnes of the New York Times. Quote, for some of President Trump's loudest cheerleaders, it was a story too good to check out. Black Lives Matter's protesters in Portland, Oregon, had burned a stack of Bibles and then topped off the fire with American flags. There was even a video to prove it. The story was a near perfect fit for a central Trump campaign talking point that with liberals and Democrats comes godless disorder, and it went viral among Republicans without, within hours of appearing earlier this month. The New York Post wrote about it. 
So did the Federalists, saying the protesters had shown their true colors. Senator Ted Cruz, the Texas Republican, said of the protesters, this is who they are. Donald Trump Jr., the president's son, tweeted that Antifa had moved to the book-burning phase. The truth was far more mundane. A few protesters, among the many thousands, appear to have burned a single Bible, and possibly a second, for kindling to start a bigger fire. None of the other protesters seemed to notice or care. Okay, so the New York Times' fact check of protesters burned Bibles is, yes, they did, but also if you say that, you're bad and lying. The story wasn't too good to check. The story was true. My favorite here is that the New York Times, like that description is fantastic. A few protesters among them did X. Well, you know, if it was only a few, well, then I guess they didn't do it at all. A few is just the same as zero. I mean, we can round down like three to zero, can't we? Let's just round it down. If it were like seven, you'd probably have to round it up to 10, but like three, we can round it down to zero. A few protesters appear to have burned a single Bible, not more than one, and possibly, a, well, maybe it was more than one Bible, like everybody said, for kindling to start a bigger fire. Guys, they weren't burning the Bible just to burn the Bible. They were doing it to start a bigger fire that included the American flag, guys. I mean, it was doing it for kindling. I mean, I don't know how many times you guys have not been able to get your stove started and you have to, you know, bring a match. You know, you light a match and then you bring it over to your, your gas stove. You, you turn on the, the stove and you, you light the match to the stove to, to light the fire. I don't know about you, but when I've run out of kindling, I immediately go into my library, take out a Bible, and I just use that. To start, it's just kindling. You know, the best sort of kindling is Bibles, as we all know. I mean, according to the New York Times, these people who are burning things, it wasn't that the point was to burn a Bible. It's that they were using the Bible as kindling. The greatest kind of kindling. You know what else makes great kindling? American flags, motherhood, baseball, and apple pie. These things all make incredible kindling. Here's how the New York Times covered this. In the rush to paint all the protesters as Bible-burning zealots, few of the politicians or commentators who weighed in on the incident took the time to look into the story's veracity or to figure out that it had originated with a Kremlin-backed video news agency. Now, days later, the Portland Bible burnings appear to be one of the first viral Russian disinformation hits of the 2020 presidential campaign. It's real video of a thing that actually happened. And the New York Times is like, well, I mean, it kind of happened, but it was mostly for kindling and also Russians. Russians everywhere. Under my bed, there are Russians. And if you retreated a video and it came from a Russian, even if the video is true, it came from the Ruskies, the Ruskies. It can't be real. I'm very much looking forward to everything bad for Democrats and protesters being categorized as Russian propaganda. That's going to be very, very exciting. And, and continuing to really, you know, burnish the reputation of the New York Times here. With election day drawing closer, says the New York Times, the Russian efforts to influence the vote appear to be well underway. American intelligence officials said last week Russia was using a range of techniques to, to denigrate Democrats and their presumptive presidential nominee, Joe Biden. By the way, how's that New York Times coverage been on that same exact intelligence report suggesting that China was doing the same thing on behalf of Joe Biden and Iran was doing the same thing on behalf of Joe Biden? Doesn't exist. None. Zero. The Russian technique is a kind of information laundering akin to money laundering. Stories originate with Russian-backed news sites, some of them directly connected to Moscow spy agencies. Officials and experts said, this is QAnon kind of crap, honestly. Like, this is just conspiracy theory garbage pushed by the New York Times to gaslight you. Because it turns out that a video that was accurate came from a Russian news source. It's an accurate video. It's accurate. This, the video on which the story came is based, is based came from Ruptly, which regularly streams a live feed from the protest for a few hours each night and then clips together a short video of highlights. The live stream and the clip later edited down by Ruptly shows at least one Bible burning after midnight on August 1st as some protesters were trying to build a fire. Again, I, I love the narrative here from the New York Times. They, they just used the, they were using the Bible to build a fire, guys. That means they weren't burning the Bible. I mean, they were using it to build a fire. I, again, when I go to the matchbook that I have, you know, in the side drawer that's filled with all the, the extra keys and all that crap, when I go in there, I don't just keep the matches there. I keep a Bible just to make sure that I can get the fire started. A small crowd can be seen hanging around. Some of the people watching the flames grow higher. The scene looks and sounds as if it is far from the main action of the protest. So good, good journalism here. They, they just, it sounds like it. It sounds like, like, did you investigate? Nope. The Bible appears to be used as kindling by two protesters working on the fire. There's no discernible reaction from the crowd as the book is put in the flames, along with twigs and branches, notebook pages, and, pa and newspapers. The crowd does cheer when an American flag is thrown on the flames. So, yeah, that sort of undermines your case a little bit. But then people on Twitter started to repeat it. And then because people on Twitter started to repeat it, then it became a story. And this is all about the GRU and Russia today. God bless it. The New York Times. The democracy dies in darkness media. They are just amazing at their job. 
They are amazing at their jobs. All righty, we'll be back here later today with two additional hours of content. Also, become an all-access member and you can hang out with me this evening. We'll discuss my book. Perhaps I will read to you rap lyrics with classical music as background. It's something that we used to do on the show a lot more often. So maybe we'll do that again because it's always hilarious. Otherwise, we'll see you here tomorrow. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Colton Haas. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. Playback and media operated by Nick Sheehan. Associate producer, Katie Swinnerton. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Nika Geneva. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. President Trump weighs in on Joe Biden's VP pick. A Wisconsin bureaucrat official orders his employees to wear those masks even when they're on conference calls alone in their homes. And the president scores a major win against the deep state. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show. Hey, 